workers on inferior wages. And last week, about 100 workers walked off the job at an East Perth development when it was discovered that Filipino workers were being paid not in, not in wages, but with board and food. You know, and I suppose I think that the reason that this sort of stuff is allowed to go on is because of the absolutely petty fines um, and the slaps on the wrist that are on offer for this kind of blatant exploitation. You know, there's just no disincentive for the, co for the companies involved in this kind of activity to stop what they're doing because they know that they're, they're going to make the super profits while they're doing it and just get a, a minor slap on the wrist later on. Chevron is able to wash its hand of all responsibility because they basically just claim that they expect all their contractors to, to, to pay people um, decent way to, 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 abide by, um, to abide by Australian law. And in reality, it is this law that is the problem. Um, you know, we are not about being anti towards foreign workers. We believe that all workers should be, receive the same pay and conditions. If Labour was fair dinkum about protecting the living standards of Australian workers, it would and it should legislate that workers, wherever they are from, should be receiving the same pay and conditions. It would and should legislate that there are training opportunities for one, young workers in Western Australia. If companies, if companies fail to comply with this, then they should be brought into public ownership under workers' control and management to ensure that that does occur. However, this is not what the ALP is doing. They're joining in a race to the bottom to ensure that bosses' profits are minimised no matter what the cost to ordinary people is. Now, the MUA is placed at the moment to demonstrate every Friday between 12 and 2 at Chevron's head office in the Perth CBD. You know, I think this is a positive move and should be congratulated and should receive support from the wider workers' movement. However, it doesn't go far enough, and I think it reveals a bit of a broader weakness within, within the labour movement at the present time, namely the inability of unions to break away from labour and their reluctance to put forward um, progressive political alternatives to those of the ALP. You know, this is a party that, while it claims to represent working people, is in reality just another party of big business. Is it, you know, a fact which was revealed dramatically with the toppling of Rudd over the resource super profits tax, um, with a massive campaign from the resource sector against him that very swiftly saw to his downfall and replacement with Gillard, who has since slashed back that tax, which in our view was very modest, and we would have gone a lot further uh, in, 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 call, in calling for the nationalisation of these sectors. Um, and again, you could see the same sort of process on, on show in, in, in the Qantas dispute. On the 29th of October, a month, um, uh, uh, just over a month ago, the Qantas announced that it was grounding its entire fleet and locking out workers. This was in response to negotiations with three unions representing pilots, engineers and ground staff. The central claim of the unions were for pay increases and most importantly for job security. But while Alan Joyce received a 71% pay rise to take his salary up to $5 million a year, Qantas workers have been subjected to a long-term strategy to break the unions and to drive down wages and conditions and to, and, and to attack job security. Qantas, to do this, Qantas has established a number of low-cost um, air airlines under a different branding that allows them to, 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 to cut back on the wages it offers to Qantas employees. In 2008, when the crisis was first hitting, the workforce was slashed by 10%. That's over 3,000 workers that, that were made redundant um, at that time. This year, another 1,000 job losses have been announced, and, um, and with management's reluctance and, and opposition to provide job security, it is a clear indication that in the next period there are going to be further job losses to come. Now, um, the unions involved were taking, were taking limited industrial action um, when, when this occurred, when Congress took the, took the dramatic step of, of grounding its fleet. You know, I think we've got to say this was a calculated move. You know, the government quickly stepped in to bring the dispute before Fair Work Australia. And I think that Qantas were, were well aware that this was going to be the case. The reason that they took the step of locking out the workforce was they wanted it to go to arbitration. They knew that if it went to arbitration, it would be ruled in their favour. Because the, the, the ruling of Fair Work Australia to stop all industrial action didn't just apply to the lockout from Qantas, but also applied to the industrial action that, that was being taken by workers. Under the Fair Work Act, Workers can only take protecting industrial action when they're in a bargaining period. What this dispute has highlighted is that an employer can effectively stop all industrial action and force the matter into arbitration. As many commentators have highlighted, this is a win for Qantas. Fair Work Australia will not endorse the union's central claim for um, central demand for job security, and workers will now have no legal cover to protect their uh, to get to protect their jobs against future cuts for the next three years until this agreement is up. And, and, and the next one will be negotiated. You know, and, and through this process, through the, through the hearing that, that went on, 
um, all, and for all of the harsh words that you got from, from the Labour leadership and from the Labour ministers, all of that will amount to nothing. You know, while many valid criticisms of Qantas management were made, the plain fact is that it was, uh, it was, the, it was the Labour Party's industrial relations policy that allowed Qantas to take, to take this strategy. You know, it was absolutely hypocritical for the Labour leaders to stand there attacking, attacking Qantas when it was their policy that had actually led to this situation. And I think that the other sort of thing we can say about this dispute is it's, a bit, it's, been, a, it's been a major test for the trade union movement and where it's at at the present time. You know, unfortunately, it has resulted in a bit of defeat, and I think that we'll see once once we come out of arbitration, the workers won't come with, out with a favourable outcome. I.e., they won't come out with what they really wanted, which is, is, is a decent commitment uh, to to, to, uh, to job security. This is despite the heroic intentions and efforts of the workers involved in that in that dispute. You know, as soon as the lockout was announced, there should have been a major response from the union movement. Initially. The workers involved wanted to have demonstrations at the airports to, to, to raise their pride. This was actually actively, uh, actively stopped by, by the leadership of the union. Not only should they have called these demonstrations, but the ACTU should have called for a 24-hour general strike in support of the workforce, in opposition to Qantas management and in opposition to the anti-democratic, anti-trade union um, legislation of, of the Australian Labour Party. You know, this should have been linked to demands to bring Qantas back under public ownership, under workers and community control and management, um, a demand that also should be raised in relation to the resource sector, um, in, in order that these important sectors of our economy can be used for the benefit of all, and not, for just, not, and not just for the few at the top. But unfortunately, as we saw, this wasn't what occurred. And, and um, in, a, in, a, in a, I suppose its first significant uh, test in a new period, where, where, where the bosses are going to be carrying out new attacks, uh, the current crop of leaders of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the union movement have failed. Now, that's what, let me go on a little bit. I just want to briefly go over one other dispute that I just think highlights this quite well. And that's uh, just recently gone on in Melbourne with uh, a load of poultry workers that have been out on strike. This strike was, um, was about overpaying conditions. And um, the workers went out on strike, set up a picket line, and, um, <clears throat> and, and, and stayed out for a, uh, for a couple of weeks in order to defend those paying conditions. Now, what you saw happening through that strike is that the union leadership cut a back deal door with management to allow a number of trucks to leave the plant to break the picket line, where they were then sent around to a, a, core, uh, a, 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 a cool storage facility around the corner, which was then used to distribute the profits. You know, you saw, you saw report, uh, uh, workers on that picket line that actually broke down in tears, absolutely disgusted with the betrayal from, from, from the union leadership. I suppose in a slightly positive sign, despite this betrayal from the union leadership, the workers stayed out on strike and were able to win a number of concessions from management. I suppose what we would say is that with stronger leadership from the union, you could have, the, the, the duration of the strike could have been reduced and you could have seen a, be, a better outcome for the workers involved. And I think that, um, I, suppose, I suppose the lesson we can learn from that is in this new period where there are going to be further attacks on the working class, um, we, need to, we need to be critical of the current union leadership. You know, at the moment, they are not willing to, 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 to leave this fight. Where our jobs come under attack, we must fight to keep them. There have been numerous examples over the last little period, both here in WA in the public sector, uh, with the blue scope steel workers, with, with job losses announced at Qantas, and the list goes on, where job losses have been announced, and the union leaders have, had, have put up absolutely no fight. They've basically just seen their role as negotiating uh, redundancy payments, or have teamed up with the bosses to argue for protectionist measures. You know, we need to, really, I think what, what this says to us, is we need to, one, campaign for the right to strike, but two, we, 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 need to, um, we need to build the left in the, in the union organisations. We need to rebuild the ideas of the left, rebuild the ideas of socialism, and actually rebuild militant trade unions that are going to fight back against the cuts that are, that are going on at the present time. Um, I suppose I might, might, might leave it there, but I suppose I just wanted to say as well that, you know, if, if, <clears throat> if you look at a number of disputes ar um, around the world, for instance in, in, in the UK with the, with the Lindsay Oil dispute, in that dispute there, you saw, um, you, saw, uh, you saw an attack on the workforce where they were trying to bring in foreign workers, undermine paying conditions. And through the intervention of workers, through the intervention of the Socialist Party, you saw nationalist demands uh, were put to the side, you saw workers' solidarity um, built, and you saw, and you saw concessions won from, from, uh, from the management. And I think that one of the lessons we can learn from that is, is the important role of socialists, is the important role of class-conscious politics when it comes to trade unions. And, and, and I suppose, uh, I, I think that that highlights the importance 
of, of building up socialist ideas today for the, for the battles that will come.